All right, before we get into talking about some more info about arterial lines, and particularly the insertion of one, it is important that you have a good understanding of the arterial line system. So let's go ahead and talk about our A-line setup now. All right, and welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to try and give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by taking these complex critical care subjects and making them easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. Do make sure you hit that bell icon though so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. To test your knowledge at the end of this lesson, head on over to icuadvantage.com or follow the link down in the lesson description. Check your learning while also being entered into weekly gift card drawings. Also, don't forget that the notes for this lesson, as well as all the others that I have, are available to the YouTube and Patreon members, along with some other great benefits as well. You can find links to both of those down in the lesson description as well. All right, so sometimes the insertion of our A-line is gonna be a calm process and really happening on our own time. Other times though, it's gonna be during an emergency and time is really of the essence for having it prepared and ready to go. In this lesson, we're gonna review over the whole system, how it works, as well as talk about how it is that we set one up from scratch. So let's start off real quickly talking about the different parts of our arterial line. So there's a few things that you're gonna need to make up our system. You're obviously gonna need an arterial cap Catheter. You're going to need a 500 milliliter bag of normal saline. You can use a liter bag, um, but this is often going to be pretty wasteful. You're going to need a pressure bag for that bag of saline, and do make sure that it is the appropriate size for the bag of fluid that you're using. You're going to need pressure tubing, and this is usually going to contain the transducer already in it. And then finally, you're going to need the cable that goes from the transducer to your monitor. Now, for the completed system, this is basically how it works. So we have our patient with with an arterial catheter placed into one of their arteries. So I am gonna be talking about this more in the next lesson here, so keep an eye out for that. Attached to the arterial catheter is going to be our pressure tubing. And this tubing is gonna be different than standard IV tubing. From the end where it connects to the arterial catheter all the way up to the transducer, it uses a very stiff tubing. If you remember from two lessons ago, this short stiff tubing is gonna be used to reduce the amount of damping that takes place. This allows for most of the energy of the pressure wave to make it all the way up to the transducer. Now, somewhere along this stiff tubing is gonna be a spot for you to access blood, as well as possibly a device to aid in sampling that blood. This is something I'm gonna talk about more in just a minute here. Moving along from here, the next part of the setup is going to be our transducer. And so this is the piece that converts the pressure in the tubing into the waveform and numbers that we see on our monitor. Now, just below the transducer, so between between it and the end of the tubing or where the patient will be is a three-way stopcock. And this stopcock here is how we're going to zero our transducer. Now on the transducer is going to be a flush whip or a fast flush activator. And typically the system that we use has a basic forward flow of fluids. So this really helps to prevent infection and thrombus formation and to help to keep the catheter functioning longer. And the amount of flow that we typically see is gonna be anywhere from three to five mLs per hour. Sometimes though, we do need to flush fluid faster through the line. So pulling out on this stretchy whip will actually open the flush line, which gives us a much faster flow of the fluid while it's open. Now, coming off the transducer, we're going to have two parts. First is going to be the connector to attach the cable that's going to go to our monitor. And then next will be regular tubing that has a roller clamp and goes to a drip chamber with a spike at the end. The spike here is used to spike your bag of saline. The saline bag will be inside of the pressure bag that I mentioned, and it is important that this does remain properly pressurized to keep the flow of saline moving forward and to ensure accuracy of the reading that we get. And so this is the overall basic setup of what we need and how this system functions at a basic level. At this point, I do want to talk more about the blood sampling and the way that you really sample arterial blood from your patient is going to vary depending on the type of setup that you have. There's three primary setups and each of these all impact the part of the tubing that is from the transducer to the catheter. The first setup that I want to talk about is actually going to be our traditional sample 
sampling setup. So for this setup, there's actually going to be a stopcock that we can use to draw both the waste and then the needed sample. Now in some setups, we're going to have this three-way added at the end that attaches right before the catheter. For these setups, this is best to minimize wasted blood. Now if this three-way is not added at the end, the three-way that's just below the transducer, that one that we use for zeroing, we can also use that one. Now for this setup, in order to draw your sample, you're going to remove the cap over the open end of the stopcock and then you're going to attach your syringe and then turn your stopcock at your access site off to the transducer. This is going to be the direction that your lever is facing. So we're going to turn it in the direction of the transducer. This will have an open line from the open port to the catheter. From here you would withdraw your waste and then turn it off to the patient. You'd then disconnect your waste and then attach your syringe for the sample and then turn the stopcock back off to the transducer and this will allow you to draw your sample. Once you have your sample and you're done, go ahead and recap it at this point and then turn it off to the open port and then use the flush whip to flush any remaining blood in the line back to the patient. So while this traditional setup does work, they do pose some potential risks. First, any stopcock is at risk for being moved or aligned improperly. So this can impair the reading that you get, but more importantly that this could allow blood to flow out from your patient and massive exsanguination can happen pretty quickly this way and so remember the way that the handle is facing out to is where it is off and so we want to have the handle facing towards the open port when it's not in use. Another potential risk with this setup is the risk of improper sampling of diluted blood. So if enough waste is not drawn, that this can actually dilute the sample and lead to erroneous results. In addition to this, if your facility does not return this blood, this can also lead to unnecessary wasted blood. And then finally, also because we're uncovering and opening and accessing our system, we are increasing the risk of contamination. So here, think you have two to three accesses to draw a waste, draw a sample, and possibly return that waste. All of these are putting your patient at risk for contamination and possibly infection. Now, the other two potential ways to draw a sample are going to be with setups that have built-in waste systems. Now, these systems are better than the traditional as they eliminate the waste of blood. And there's really two main setups for this. The first setup is going to be the syringe setup. So this one has a built-in syringe near the transducer. When you're ready, you would turn your stopcock off to the transducer and then withdraw your waste into the built-in syringe. This setup still uses a three-way stopcock to attach and draw a sample, just like the traditional setup. Now this still has some of the same concerns as the traditional setup, all except for the wasted blood. And this is because we have the waste in that syringe that's built into the system. And so once we get our sample, we would just turn the stopcock off to the open port and then return the sample by depressing the syringe until it's back in the locked position. After you return the blood that's in the syringe, you would activate the fast flush to flush the remainder of the line, but you are going to want to turn that stopcock off to the patient so that you can flush out the open end of the stopcock. All right, and then the other possible setup is going to be with an accordion reservoir. And this seems to be the most common and really the safest setup to use. So this actually uses an accordion style reservoir for withdrawing your waste. Along with that reservoir, there's also a vamp attachment for using a needleless access to get your blood sample, and both of these which are going to be at the end of the tubing close to the patient. Now with this setup, there is no three-way to access, and instead, it, like I said, it uses that vamp attachment to draw your sample. These have been shown to have much less risk for infection and doesn't create another spot for possible exsanguination. And so here you would simply pull back on the accordion in order to pull back your waist. Then there's a valve for you to turn into the off position, which at this point would be crossing the tube. Tubing. This way, when you draw your sample from the vamp attachment, you're drawing from the patient and not the reservoir. Once again, once you've gotten that sample, go ahead and turn that valve to allow flow back from the reservoir, depress the reservoir back down until it's in the lock position, returning that blood to the patient, and then use the flush whip activator in order to flush the remainder of the line. Here, since we don't have a three-way that we're working with, we don't have to flush out the open end. So definitely a lot of benefits to using a system like this. All right, so with that stuff explained, prior to the arterial catheter being inserted, we want to fully prepare our setup. 
Now this is something that you wanna make sure that you are using a septic technique. It's not a sterile process to set this up, but it is important that certain parts aren't touched and do remain sterile. So this is gonna include the spike for the bag of fluids, any caps and open ports on stopcocks, as well as the very end of the tubing. So in order to set this up, the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is spike the bag of saline. Now we do wanna remove all the air from this bag. Now from here, we wanna fill up the drip chamber almost completely, and then take that bag of saline and and then hang it inside of the pressure bag, but don't inflate it just yet. At this point here, now we wanna prime our pressure tube setup and remove all of the air. It's really important that we do this not under high pressure as this can actually damage the transducer. In order to do so, we wanna make sure that our roller clamp just below the drip chamber is unclamped. And the first thing is we want to prime to the transducer and the zero point, which is gonna be that three-way stopcock just below it. And so here, we wanna make sure that that stopcock is off towards the patient or the end of the tubing. This is gonna allow a free flow of fluid down through the transducer and out the side port. Now, you may have a cap on the the end of this three-way stopcock that actually has a hole on it. If you have that, then you're not gonna need to remove that cap, otherwise you will have to remove the cap for this step. Now go ahead and activate the fast flush whip and then flush down through the transducer until you have flushed out the open end of the three-way. At this point, go ahead and replace that cap if you had to remove it. And then from here, if you are using a setup with a built-in waste system, we need to flush to this and ensure that all of the air is out of that waste system. So we're we're now going to turn the stopcock just below the transducer off to the open port. If you're using a syringe system, pull back and open the syringe just a little bit. If you're using the accordion reservoir, make sure that it's pulled back and open slightly as well. Now the trick here is to make sure that the waste system will fill with fluid before the remainder of the tubing. In order to do this, if you ensure that the remaining tubing is held above the level of the waste system, that you should get all of the air out of the waste system first. Doing this is essentially going to ensure that the waste system fills with saline while the air in there moves up and along the rest of the tubing. Now from there, continue to activate the flush whip until the saline has come out the end of the tubing, and then go ahead and depress your syringe or close your accordion at this point until it's in that locked position. Now if you are using a setup without the built-in waste system, we are going to need to flush to the end of the system. So if you have another three-way near the patient for access, we're going to treat this one just like the zero stopcock. So turn this stopcock off to the patient, or the open end of the tubing, remove the cap if no hole is present, prime until saline exits that open port, replace the cap if you had to remove it, turn the stopcock off to the open port, and continue priming until saline exits the end of the tubing. Now, once you have everything primed, you wanna ensure that you inspect the entire length of the tubing for any air that may be trapped. So it's really important that we ensure that all air is removed from this line. Continue flushing and priming if you do see any air bubbles present. When you do this, make sure that all of the stopcocks are off to the open port, this way to ensure that no air is entering the system here. Now, once you have the entire system fully primed, go ahead and inflate the pressure bag. We need to ensure that we have greater than 300 millimeters of mercury of pressure inside of the bag. Now there should be a gauge that will show the level of pressure and typically we'll have a green section once the proper pressure is achieved. There's also a waste gate on the pressure bag that should prevent any overinflation. Once that is fully inflated, then we want to go ahead and replace any temporary caps with holes over those open end ports on the three-way stopcocks. So these are only used for priming and need to be replaced with actual caps that do not allow flow. Then from here, go ahead and connect your pressure cable from the end of the transducer and attach it to your monitor and ensure that the pressure graph shows up and make sure that it is set to arterial line if needed. Finally, we want to zero and level the transducer, which is something that I am gonna talk about this more in the last lesson of this series. And so at this point, the tubing is primed and ready to go to attach to the arterial catheter once it is inserted. And that covers our review of the arterial line system, as well as how we get this set up and ready to go for insertion. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this lesson, leave it a like as it really helps YouTube know to show this lesson to even more and more people. I also really enjoy all the comments that you guys leave and I do try to respond to just about everybody. If you haven't already, consider subscribing to always catch the latest videos as I release them every week. And if you wanna learn more about this topic or really anything related to critical care, then head down to the video description. I do have links to 
some of my favorite books on the subject. While you're down there, also check out some of the awesome t-shirt designs that I have listed. And then finally, a shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members. Your support truly means the world to me and a big thank you to you guys. Now, if you'd be interested in showing support for this channel and want to get some of the extra content that only members receive, then either join the YouTube membership down below or head on over to the Patreon page and check out some of the ways to show support over there. Now, don't worry if you don't because truly your support just in watching these videos and sharing them with other people is greatly appreciated. So until I see you guys for the next lesson, here's a couple of really awesome videos to check out. Thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.